Now, a lot of us don't have actually physical Bibles, but if you do, please will you turn to Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. Um, it's very important that we do look at different parts of the Bible that we don't normally look at, and this is one of them. Judges. It, it is actually very early on in the development of Israel as a nation. It's not properly developed, and it's a, it's a time of uh, development, and uh, there's a lot to learn from the book of Judges. Um, I'm just going to read the first uh, six verses as an introduction, and then after that, I will look at an introduction, and then we've got two main points we're going to look at as we look at Gideon. Two main things are going to come out of this study of Gideon. Here we go, Judges chapter 6, verse 1. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Uh, they were a uh, tribe in the desert not too far away. Okay? So they're a neighbor. And see what happens. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep, nor cattle, nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them or the camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. And the reason I've read this is that in the book of Judges, there is a continual cycle and this is part of the cycle. And it's a human cycle. We see it down through history, including the history, the long history of the Christian church for 2,000 years. It's a cycle that starts well. There are people that are serious with God and know the Lord and preach his word and try and live it out in whatever culture it is. And then the next generation, things decline. And People don't have such a strong faith. In the third generation, they've turned right away from God completely. And they're not following the Lord at all, but following some other philosophy, some other idolatry or religion, whatever. And then things go bad. Things go bad morally, spiritually, socially, and in this case, of course, if you followed it, economically. It's very topical, isn't it? Because a neighbor invades a neighbor and completely trashes the country. So it's highly relevant to what's going on in, in Europe today, isn't it? Eastern Europe today. And I do want to say it's nice to have a Ukrainian with us in the service today, um, visiting us. There's a cycle, but that isn't the end of that. That's the down bit of the cycle. And at the bottom, the people say, look, it's time we remembered God. What about God? Someone just told us that God, there is a God there who did things in the past. We don't see anything about God, but let's, let's cry out in prayer. Let's have a great prayer meeting. Let's seek God in prayer because things are so bad. And they call out to God and God answers in a particular way. It's not the way they want, probably. Not the way they want. But God answers. And so that's the cycle in this book of, of Judges. But I put it to you, it is also a human cycle. It may be a cycle in your very own life. It may be a cycle where you come from. And it certainly is a cycle in the last 2,000 years, the long history of the Christian church. So we're looking at Gideon and um, we're going to learn lessons as we look at Gideon. And what we're going to look at is two things under two headings, but the biggest 
75% is his first one. I better warn you of that, because if you think this guy's lost his way, he's going to go until one o'clock or something like that, you know. Um, so the first is 75% of it. The man God uses. The man God uses. It's very interesting. As we, as we look at this now, we're going to jump in. By, by the way, God sends a prophet. It's interesting. We don't know his name. And he says, look, don't get it wrong. There will be other people giving other analyses of why things have gone wrong. There will be other views, but this is the word of the Lord. This has happened because you've turned away from the Lord. Okay, so now what we're going to now do is look at the first bit, and that is from verse 11 to 24. Now, I'm sorry, it's a slightly longer reading today. Well, I shouldn't apologize for that because this is the word of the Lord. Okay. But from verse, we're going to read from verse 11. Uh, and there's a long history. I'll, I'll, what I want us to see today is the way God will intervene and answer the prayers of his people when things get so bad, they, they really cry out to him. They don't just have a prayer meeting, but it comes desperate. And there's a cry to God. And it always is the case that then, it's, it's as if, in the first six verses I read out to you, it's as though the camera's a long way away and gives a kind of sweeping picture from a distance of the situation in Israel at the time. And now suddenly it zooms in on one man. That's what's happening here. The man that God uses. Verse 11. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah, uh, and this belonged to Joash, the Abiezrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. P -p 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 Pardon me, my Lord. Gideon replied, but if the Lord, the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and he's given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand, am I not sending you? P pardon me, my lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, my tribe, and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. Gideon replied, if now I have found favor in your eyes, Give me a sign that it really is you talking to me. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. Gideon went inside, prepared a young goat, and from an ephah of flour, he made bread. I'm sure it was Indian bread. It was roti. It wasn't English bread. We needed yeast and you didn't need two hours to let it rise. You know, you've got to realize this. This was, this was actually a roti. Uh, <laughs> putting the meat in a basket and its broth in a pot, he brought them and offered them to him under the oak. The angel of God said to him, take the meat and the unleavened bread, place them on this rock and pour out the broth. And Gideon did so. Then the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread with the tip of the staff that was in his hand, fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread, and the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Alas, alas, sovereign Lord, I've seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid. You're not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there, and called it the Lord is peace. To this day, of course that's when the book was written, I'm not quite sure who wrote it, but to this day, it stands in Ophrah of the Abiezrites. 
Okay, we'll stop there. The man God uses, the first thing we notice is that Gideon has a visitor. Gideon has a visitor. The scene is set for us. It's a village called Ophrah, uh, and Gideon is a farmer. And it's the harvest season for the wheat, and of course, to get the grain, what you normally do is go onto the top of a hill or a windy place and you thresh it against some hard rock and the wind will take the chaff away and the grain will fall. I don't know exactly what mechanism they use, but the point is the wind has to blow the chaff away. But he's not in a windy place. Where is he? He's hiding away in the wine press. Now the wine press, of course, is a great big vat down is like a huge bath and he could hide away there and he's beating away but there's not much of a wind to blow the chaff away so I reckon the bread is a bit rough that year you know you've got the chaff as well as the wheat probably and the reason he's there is because they are all petrified of the invaders they're petrified of the invaders which of course these are called the Midianites and the Malachites He's there hiding away. He is like the rest of Israel. He's absolutely scared stiff. Okay, that's the scene there. And suddenly there's a visitor. Now I want you to notice this. He's called the angel of the Lord. But he doesn't have wings. And he doesn't have a halo. We need to realize that. He, he, this is, he looks like an ordinary human being. Angelic appearances in the Bible are not normally of people with wings and that sort of thing at all. Those come in medieval paintings uh, in places like Italy, etc. But they're not in the Bible. In the Bible, they look like ordinary human beings. It's very interesting. This is, this is not part of my sermon, but I'll just say this, by the way. There's an interesting book I've got by Billy Graham, actually, called Angels. And he looks at different appearances of angels down in history. Very, very interesting. Uh, human beings. Okay, remember that. So there's, there's a person here who speaks to him and the, he's shocked by what the person says. There's no doubt about that at all. Be, uh, the, the, the poor guy is in a terrible state. He is a believer. He believes in God. He hasn't departed from the Lord. He does hold on to a faith in God, but he does not understand why are things in such an appalling mess? Now, I just want to say this before we go on. Not only in the Old Testament, but in the last 2,000 years, so many times God's people have lost the plot. They've fallen into such disgrace. They've become a laughing stock. And it's often power, money, sex have got them. You think of the long period of the Middle Ages when the church was interested in power. In fact, the church was in power. And some of you know the history, which is not my point to go into, when there was a great tussle between the so-called Holy Roman Emperor and the Pope, as to who was more powerful in Europe. And the Pope came on top. The church was involved in politics, in power. And whenever the church gets involved in those sorts of things, you can guarantee spiritually it's going to go downhill rapidly. And when, it, when it's interested in owning land and it's interested in money and when it just absorbs the culture of the day, you know it is, to use Jesus' words, it is salt that has completely lost its savour and is useless. Now that, there's a long history of that, friends, including in this country. Including in this country. My wife comes from the Welsh families. Why is it that there are so many empty chapels when there was a mighty revival, when there were hundreds of thousands of people attending church and praising God? Well, one of the reasons, of course, is the population is about a third in the Rhondda Valley of what it was then. But that's not the main reason. The main reason is people have turned right away from God and are following the idols of our current culture and are totally absorbed by the contemporary culture. And the problem is, the church has a history of just 
being influenced by the culture around and not by God and his word. And when it does that, it ceases to be effectively what God intends it to be. Salt in society. Okay, I'm making a point here. God intervenes, though, when his people cry out to him in desperation. Now, this is the history of the way that God works. Now, it is very significant, I think, we do have a prayer meeting this week, an encounter night this week, on Thursday. Will you please attend if you are serious about seeking God? We desperately want to see God move afresh in this city and in this country. We are dealing with a living God. We're dealing with the living. God is not dead. God is the living God. He intervenes. And he will do so afresh. But his people have got to get desperate. They've got to get serious in prayer. In my history, personally, in Zambia, I'll never forget the days in the 70s when God, the Spirit of God was moving. And every month there was an overnight prayer meeting when people were crying out to God. There were all sorts of prayer meetings. And the Lord heard and did a remarkable new work in the church at that time, in that country. Now, my dear friends, we're dealing with a living God. Do you believe that? That God is able to act afresh in power in the 21st century, even in this country. We need to pray. We need to pray. So let me just quickly address it. This visitor is an extraordinary person because the visitor in verse 11, 20 is called the angel of the Lord. But notice the same person is called the Lord in three places, verse 14, 16, and 18. Did you notice that? It says in verse 14, the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel from Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Now the I is not just that human being, it is the Lord himself, the God of Israel, the God who delivered Israel from Egypt's slavery, etc., etc. Okay. Um, so the visitor, very, very significant. God is intervening. So look, the man God uses, first of all, by the way, it could be a woman. Okay, there are cases, and in, in fact God, I thank God, that God has raised up a remarkable woman uh, called uh, Andrew Minchella Williams in this country to head up something called Christian Concern. And I hope some of you are following that. Thank God for her. But the, the man that God uses, first of all, there's a visitation from God. There's a meeting with God. It isn't just he's gone to the right university, he's a very clever person, or she's a very clever person. That isn't it. It's a meeting with God. That is the important thing. Secondly, Gideon's call. These extraordinary words, am I not sending you? Mighty man of valor. The guy's shaking at his knees. The guy's as scared as anything. He's petrified. These highly armed invaders coming, they've completely wrecked the country. There was a description there. They've they're just camped on the fields, there's no food for them, they're desperate, their homes have been wrecked, they're living in caves in, 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 the, in the hills of Judea, etc. And the poor guy is completely overwhelmed. What do you mean, mighty man of God? Where's God in all this? He says, the Lord is with you, mighty man of God. Go in the strength you have and say, am I not sending you? Gideon feels hopeless, small, and unable. And verse 16, I will be with you and will strike down all the Midianites. Gideon's faith is starting to rise, but he asked for a sign. Now, there's no doubt about it, that God will only use those people who've got real faith in him. So, I said at the beginning, you know, about a cycle, a cycle of de departure from God and down backsliding, complete worldliness, but then people seek God and God works and God actually raises up a person. Now, what about you in your situation? Because this applies, this cycle applies on a grand scale, but also an individual or a family scale as well. When we cry out to God, 
God will meet with us. And in this case, it's very striking. What about God at work in these days, calling people to obey him at a national level, at a local level? You know, I believe in our prayers, looking at judges, do you pray for God to raise up outstanding people in this country or whichever country is on your heart? You need to. Because the way God works. It, look, right through the Bible, it's the way God works. Raising up people. By the way, I've written down here, I'm so glad in Lighthouse there are many young generation people. My dear young people, are you burdened? Are you burdened about the spiritual, moral state of things? If you're a student at the university, if you work where you work, if you're a resident in your street, where you are, in your wider family, etc. Are you burdened? Are you burdened from God? Does God burden you with that? Do you cry out to God about it? God may well meet with you and call you to a particular word. Do you realize that? I want to say that again. God may meet with you and call you to a particular work uniquely for you. I'm looking around here and there are individuals here who've been called of God to a unique work. What about you, my young generation? By the way, I've got to say this. I'm celebrating my 80th birthday, not quite today, but nearly today, so you will get some refreshments afterwards for that. But I am absolutely thrilled at my age. I'm looking at the next generation. And I want to see God move. And I thank God for you younger people. But we've got to see a move of God in this next generation. That's what I'm praying for. And I pray for it in Zambia very much as well. So look, Gideon's call to God. And it, shake, it, it, it actually changes his whole life. It shakes him to the roots. He can't believe it, but it is God who's calling him. And actually, there was an extraordinary sign, which I, I, I'm not going to go into. He, his offering is there, and suddenly, um, a fire comes out of the rock. It's something totally supernatural. It doesn't happen very often in the Bible, by the way. Um, but there it is. Now, Gideon is called, and there's one more important thing. No, there's two more important things, actually. Gideon then is tested. I want you to listen to this. I know some of you are keen to serve God here. And what will happen is this. If the Lord calls you, you will be tested. I think back on my own experience. When the Lord called me, I was a young man. I, I, we were actually 75 and we just got married. And uh, I took my wife to this house in African Township there in Lusaka. And we were the only Muslims with white people in that township. And of course the thieves would thought, oh, these white people, they got lots and lots of money. They got lots of lovely things in the house. And we had breaking, see. And it was a terrible time. It was a time of testing for us because we felt like running. But we didn't. Hallelujah. And a man of God said to me, he said, do you know what, John? God's going to use you in Zambia because he's allowing you to be tested. I, well, the only reason I say that is Gideon is tested. And if God is going to use you, I can guarantee the Lord will test you. He's not scared to test you because he wants people who can stand and people of faith who will trust him. So look, Gideon's test. Here it is. We're going to read this now. And it's verse 25 to 32. Here we go. That same night, that same night, the Lord said to Gideon, take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old, tear down your father's altar to, to Baal, and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on the top of this height. Using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down, offer the second bull as a burnt offering. So Gideon took ten of his servants and did as the Lord told him. But because he was afraid of his family and the townspeople, he did it at night. And I guarantee he didn't do it as soon as the sun went down. He probably did it at two or three in the morning when they were all fast asleep. 
He did it at night rather than in the daytime. In the morning, when the people of the town got up, there was Baal's altar demolished with the Asherah pole beside it cut down and the second bull sacrificed on the newly built altar. They asked each other, who did this? When they carefully investigated, they were told Gideon, son of Josh, did it. The people of the town demanded of Josh, his father, bring out your son. He must die because he's broken down Baal's altar and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. But Josh replied to the hostile crowd around him, are you going to plead Baal's cause? Are you trying to save him? Whoever fights for him shall be put to death by morning. If Baal really is a god, he can defend himself when someone breaks down his altar. So because Gideon broke down Baal's altar, they gave him the name Jerobaal that day, saying, let Baal contend with him. Now this was Gideon's test. It was a tough one. The local religion was the um, fertility cult of the Baal, that was the male, the husband, and the Asherah, the female. The Baal was in the form of uh, an altar of a particular type. I'm not quite sure what it looked like. But next to it was a, a, a wooden pole, a great big tall wooden pole. And that was the female. And the two had to mate in order for there to be prosperity in the families and in, to give crops. And uh, therefore, it's not surprising, by the way, that part of the religion involved cult prostitutes. Those sexual acts were part of the religion, actually. Uh, it wasn't a wonderful religion. But that was the local religion. And they thought they got crops each year because of Baal and Asherah mating. They woke up in the morning, and the gods are gone. Actually, it was, it was a very testing thing to do because he desecrated their religion. He didn't just demolish it, he chopped it all up and it became firewood for an altar to the Lord. That's what happened. He removed the religion of Baal and Asherah and replaced it by the Lord. He also took his dad's second bull as well. So this was a test. He, he only does it, as I pointed out, in the middle of the night because he's so stiff. But nevertheless, he did it. And I think there's a lesson for us here, because honestly, many of us get scared, don't we? Many of us get scared. God tells us to do things that actually are beyond us, and we get scared. And we need to remember, there are people who get scared in the Bible as well. But he, 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 he took steps, and he was obedient. And then comes the next thing. Then comes the next thing. I better just look at my notes at this point. By the way, I just noted down here, God provided an unexpected protagonist to defend him. It was his dad, and it was his dad's religion. It was his dad's altar, and Asherah, Baal and Asherah, belonged to his dad, and the bull as well. And his dad stands up for his son, said, if, if Baal's a real God, he can defend himself. And that was it. He stood for his son. So, <clears throat> three things. Gideon as a visitor. We need to pray for God to meet with individuals, to call them out, to empower them. Secondly, he's called of God, he's specific call. Thirdly, there's a test. But th fourthly, finally, there's an empowering by the Spirit of God. Gideon is empowered by God. Gideon is empowered, and here it's just a couple of verses, and it says this. It's verse 33. Almost. Now all the Midianites, the Malachites, and other eastern peoples joined forces, crossed over the Jordan, and camped in the valley of Jezreel. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, summoning the Abiezrites to follow him. And he sent messengers throughout all the, his, his tribe of Manasseh and the other tribes, Asher, Asher, Zebulun, Naphtali. Those are the tribes in the north of Israel, by the way, in that area where he lived. And so they too went up to meet with him. Now suddenly he's changed. Did you notice that? The Spirit of God comes upon him, and instead of quaking with fear, now he's got a boldness and a courage. And he blows the trumpet. Now that was in Israel a sign of calling. You're summoning people. This is summoning people and mustering them for the army to come as an army. 
and the Spirit of God comes upon him. Now, I want you to notice this. In the Old Testament, the Spirit only comes on individuals here and there. Gideon, upon David, upon a few individuals. Under the New Covenant, which we're under, which we call Christianity, uh, no, there's not that word, of course, in the Bible. It's just called the New Covenant, people of the way, different names. But those who follow Jesus, actually the Spirit of God is given to all God's people. The promise of the Spirit is given to all God's people. And we need to be hungry and thirsty for more of the Spirit of God to be poured out upon us. If we're going to see great things happen, things turn around where you are, it will be through people anointed by the Holy Spirit. And we need to recognize that. And so in the New Testament, you've got the same thing. You've got Peter, James, and John, after Jesus is, it ascends to heaven, the disciples are scared stiff. They lock themselves away in the upper room. They're absolutely petrified of the Jews. They know they're in danger. And then the Spirit of God comes upon them, and there's these extraordinary manifestations of fire, of speaking in foreign languages, prophesying, preaching powerfully, and it, it is quite extraordinary. They get scared later on, the first time they're beaten, and they, they, they're before the same court that sent Jesus to the cross, the same people they're brought before, and it's extraordinary how bold they are. But when they go back to the church, and they say, look, we've got, we've got to pray, and they cried out to God to make them bold, and they went forth, it tells us, when they were filled with the Spirit of God and spoke the Word of God fiercely and boldly. It's quite extraordinary. I want to, I, I'm just pointing out the same thing here as we get in the New Testament. Okay. Now then, summary. In a time of spiritual moral decline, when God's people call on him, what does he do? He raises up a man, could be a woman, but normally a man who loves and will obey him a man empowered by the Holy Spirit, made bold and fearless. Now, lastly, and this is much, much shorter, the method, the man God uses, the method God uses, and that's chapter 7. And chapter 7, you have to read through most of it on your own. It's actually gripping stuff. It really is gripping stuff. You've got to remember, Israel is completely invaded and overwhelmed by these um, Midianites who've got camels and donkeys, goodness, and what cattle, and they've just trampled on everything. They've occupied their houses. It's completely taken over. The method God uses, chapter 7. I'm just going to read a few verses here. Early in the morning, Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and all his men camped at the spring of Harod, in the camp of Midian, was north of them in the valley near the hill of Mori. It's a specific place in the, the northern part of Israel. And go there today. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men, I cannot deliver them. Midian, into your hands, or Israel would boast against me. My own strength has saved me. Now announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left and 10,000 men remained. So the method God uses I want us to think of very, very quickly, and it's simply this. The biggest barrier, it seems, in the Bible to God using people is human pride. The biggest enemy is human pride, and it's deeply ingrained in all of us, isn't it? We think we're, we're very intelligent, and we're very advanced technologically, and so on and so forth, and we are, it's remarkable. Quite remarkable the way we've advanced in all these things. But in terms of godliness, in terms of morality, absolutely not. And yet, human pride is, seems to be deeply, deeply ingrained in us. That is a huge barrier. And it comes up here. God says, the biggest thing that's going to stop me using you is your pride. You're going to boast. Look at us! We're so great, our arm is so great, we've got so many of us, we're well trained, we've got muscles, we've got biceps, we've got whatever, we've got wonderful spears and weapons and all the rest. We're going to be so boastful and think wonderful. I'm not going to be able to use you. It's very interesting. The method God uses is not what we would expect. 
Because first of all, the numbers were severely thinned down. Because we carry on reading. They went down from 32,000 to a very good arm. They could have done something with 32,000 against the Midianites, who were more than that, by the way. Um, but the Lord said to Gideon in verse 4, There are still too many men. Take them down to the water, and I'll thin them out for you there. If I say this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. And Gideon took the men down to the water, and actually they ended up in verse 6 with 300 of them drank from cupped hands, lapping like dogs, and all the rest, uh, uh, they drank on their knees. And the Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the others go home. Imagine that. His army is down to 300. It's crazy. It is crazy. But you get the point, don't you? We get the point. This is not because of human greatness and power and numbers. This is because of the hand of God. Because Israel is in such a, a spiritual darkness, they don't really believe in God at all. He's not real to them. And God says, I'm going to show you that I am the same God that delivered through Moses, delivered your ancestors out of Egypt. I'm the same God, and I'm going to do it for you. This is very, very important, isn't it? The method that God uses. And I, I thought about this, it, it, even in, in my lifetime. The, the, the method that God uses, and the man that God uses. Um, I'm just going to give you, I'm just going to give you uh, one example. Last September, a man of God from Holland died. His name was Brother Andrew. His name, I think, was Anders Pandapayo. I think it was his real name. Now, Brother Andrew began a great, great work of God and has become Open Doors Mission. And Brother Andrew was a young guy, your age, many of you, in his 20s, and he, he had a burden for the church in those days behind the Iron Curtain, okay? Uh, some of you, you've read it in history, haven't you? The Iron Curtain, uh, Eastern Europe, etc. Central Eastern Europe was all under Russian occupation. It was all communist in those days, etc. Uh, and of course, it was difficult to be a Christian there. There weren't many Bibles, etc. Uh, and he, he went, he just, this young man went, and he, he went to Poland to a conference there. And God gave him connections with people from just a few individuals from a few different countries. And he went with his little old beetle, Volkswagen beetle, and he had Bibles in the back. Uh, I think they were initially in Serbo-Croat for what used to be called U Yugoslavia. Of course, it's now Serbia, Croatia, and lots of other countries. <laughs> um, and he went there. Uh, just one single guy on his own. Crazy. But actually, that was mightily used of God, and it developed into a whole movement. God was behind it. There would be, there'd be so many cases like that. So many cases. God, the method God uses are in line. The people that God uses are not the ones you expect. They're the ones who've got a heart for God, a burden to see the, the kingdom of God come, and those who seek God, and the Spirit of God anoints them. Those are the people who use the God, and the methods, amazing. Ver, <laughs> 1 Corinthians 1, 27, 28, it says this, God chose the weak things of the world to shame the, the, the strong. He, he chose, uh, I'll have to get the rest of the words here, I'm so sorry, I'm going to look at that, it's so important we get this. Uh, apologies, take one moment to, here we are, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. It's on the screen. <laughs> Some of you know this off by heart, it's really good stuff. It says, God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. I, I want to emphasize Human pride is the biggest barrier to being used by God. So, <laughs> the method God uses, numbers were severely thinned down, but clever psychological warfare was actually used. Just listen to this, it's really, really fascinating stuff. 
Um, I'll just read down quickly verse 17, I think it is. Um, um, wrong chapter, I've been here, yeah. Where are we? Um, Watch me, Gideon told them, follow my lead. This is at night time now, I've got the middle of the night. When I get to the edge of the camp, do exactly as I do. When I and all who are with me blow our trumpets, then from all around the camp, you think all these 300 men surrounded the camp, I don't know, maybe 100 meters between them, between each one. When I and all who are with me blow our trumpets, then from around the camp, blow your, blow your trumpets and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. Now these guys are fast asleep, it's the middle of the night. And suddenly they hear this eerie sound of these trumpets blowing, probably ram's horn trumpets they were, a swirling sort of sound. And then the shout for the Lord and for Gideon. Gideon and a hundred men with him reached the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just after they changed the guard. They blew their trumpets, broke the jars, that made a noise, bash, they broke their clay jars, and there were actually torches then, uh, were, were, the torches were hidden inside the jars, and suddenly all around the camp there were, there were, there were lights. And what happened is panic struck the camp in the middle of the night, and they began lashing out with their swords at one another, and they started killing one another. And panic just spread, and they, they ran. And as daylight came, thousands and thousands of them were running to the east, running back to the desert, chased by, actually the trumpet blew, and more people joined them, and they chased them. It was an extraordinary victory. Who did it? It was the Lord and Gideon. The big partner was the Lord, the small partner was Gideon. But we do have to say that methods do include clever methods. And I've just got a couple of things I noted down here as we, we kind of wrap this whole thing up. I think one of the reasons that God has blessed the Alpha Course so much, the Alpha Course is at least 30, it's 30 years old, is the Alpha Course, is actually, it was a simple method you don't have church meetings. You don't have a big band or, uh, in the old days, an organ or anything like that. You have it in a home. And you have a meal appropriate to the people you've got. There's a little talk. There's discussion. There's a sense of community develops. Uh, it, it's a simple method, but it's completely different from what the church has been doing for a long time. And I think this is important. Methods are not unimportant. I think that's it here as well. I notice when I pray for France, uh, we're part of a mission group and some of the work is in France. In Fr France, a very difficult country to reach for the gospel. But they use different methods. They have concerts, a lot of music concerts. They, they do art exhibitions, um, which are gospel exhibitions. Uh, they, they've got different methods of reaching out. And so we need to we need clever methods, different methods, and that is why we need younger generation people who've got creative ideas that come from God. Now I want to wrap this up, folks, because look, this is really important. And as I do so, I was reminded when I lived in South Africa years ago, a front page of the newspaper, there there was a picture of Brother Andrew arriving at Johannesburg Airport with his case. And he had his case lifted up, and on his case he had these words written. God's, my God's not dead, dash, sorry about yours. <laughs> and it was there all over the newspaper. And I thought to myself, as I finished this talk, that's it, isn't it? <clears throat> Our God is not dead. Yours might be. The one you say you don't believe in. Yes, but our God is not dead. He's the same God that worked in the Old Testament, that brought Jesus. The same God who's poured out his spirit down through church history. And I reminded you, in, in Wales, where this comes from, I don't know, I think it reached Cardiff as well as the Welsh Valley, the revival there. Um, 
God did extraordinary things. He's doing amazing things right now, right now, as we sit here in other parts of the world, including, by the way, in Ukraine. I read, I, I have it on my phone every day. Nay sends it every day uh, to pray for student work in Ukraine. And it is amazing what God is doing there, despite the terrible, terrible things happening there. God is at work. He's a living God. But he needs people who are going to get on their knees and cry out to him and say, Lord, things are bad here. We want to see your mighty hand at work afresh. Let us pray now, shall we? If anyone wants prayer, I'll be over there with um, Esther afterwards. Please get your samosas and cake and celebrate my 80th birthday and Mother's Day at the back, okay? Shall we call on God? Oh, our gracious, wonderful Heavenly Father, as we sit in this building, I'm just reminded of our ancestors who actually constructed this building originally, who loved you and worshipped you and gave glory and honour to you. Lord, we're living in such a different day now, but we adore and worship you. You're not out of date. You're not dead. You're the living God. And I praise you that you are at work today. I thank you that there are those, the last few months, even through this, the work of this church, who've come to faith in Jesus and have been born anew. And Lord, we say to you, oh our God, we want the name of Jesus to be lifted high afresh in this country. We, are, we, we want to see the Holy Spirit poured out afresh. And we know the way you work is to raise up people, may raise up men, men of God, women of God, filled with the Spirit of God, who are called of God, and know their God, and are led by the Spirit of God. Lord, will you call up people? Will you call people? Even in this congregation this morning, may the Spirit of God be at work in some way, with some part of the kingdom of God in mind. Grant it, Lord. May the Spirit of God be at work in individuals for the cause of Jesus and his great kingdom. We ask it in your name, Lord Jesus.